No, I can't see myself. I can see lots of blacked out boxes. No. Uh, um, if you wanted to see yourself, then we could go back and make that work. Um, it doesn't matter that much, uh, I suppose. Okay. So let's just carry on, shall we? Uh, okay. Right. I mean, I'm we assuming can you. you can see me and you can hear me. So let's uh, just get started. Uh, I certainly intending. Uh, okay. We'll right. I'll get started. Sorry. Um, I thought I'd cheer you up with a nice bright image to start with. We're going to end up looking at this site later on towards the end of my talk. But I first wanted to uh, acknowledge the help of John Gilbert, who, if you know about hunting and in medieval Scotland, will know that he wrote the seminal book on hunting and hunting reserves in medieval Scotland back in 1979. And on his retirement, uh, he had an interest in pursuing these things again. And we got together and did the work on this particular site that you form and open the borders which we will come to at the end of my talk so that's my acknowledgements over uh, the basic research behind this is that i was asking the question well what does archaeological evidence tell us about hunting hunting forests in the medieval period and it's been a, a topic that kept cropping up in the various things that I've done over the years, ever since actually I did my research on medieval villages in North Northumberland and actually had a site there on the edge, several sites on the edges of the forest of Cheviot. And uh, some of those sites had particular characteristics which will crop up in this book. So I, it's something that goes right the way back and it kept cropping up in the work I did with the Royal Commission and led to there was a paper in 2007, which was published in 2009 in Ruralia, which I think Roland was asking about earlier. Right, but um, the what I'm going to do with tonight's talk is, first of all, I'll introduce you to hunting forests and hunting practice, and then we'll start looking at the structural remains that can be found in the landscape and what those are and how, how they're constructed and what that tells us about hunting practice. Okay, so that's the uh, basic outline. And well, be, as a result of that, I'll be introducing you to a, something that probably you've not met before, which is a thing called a hay. So we shall, uh, uh, in, we'll have a look at what that means. Right. Hunting forests, I'm sure many of you know, uh, introduced to Scotland in the 12th century by King David. David was brought up in England at the court of Henry I. He was used to and knew what a hunting forest was. And when he came to Scotland and became king, he decided he would uh, introduce this uh, notion, which is completely new to Scotland, and was actually uh, at variance with existing practice and law, which was uh, that if deer crossed your land, it was fair game. So as the Roman law raised nullius. This was a bit of a power grab, there's no doubt about it. Uh, it also introduced um, the idea that uh, if you took those deer on the king's forest, in the king's forest, you would suffer consequences. There was a £10 fine for, some, for repeated offence. Um, that was quite a lot of money, so it was a significant uh, punishment. Initially, it was introduced to royal estates, so we, and we get places, uh, Ettrick Forest, we get Jedburgh Forest, and other uh, areas of royal domain that could be created as a, a royal forest. During the, so doing that didn't cross or tread on too many toes, but then they were extended to the baron's estate. So some of the followers of King David, like the Bruce, got Annandale and he got free forests and free forests isn't that free really it just meant that the the, the Bruce family had the right to run a, a forest in the same way as the king on his land of course the king could go and hunt there too because actually it was a devolved power it could be taken away of course so large parts of Scotland were turned over to this method of managing hunting and uh, 
and managing deer on behalf of the benefit, of course, of the crown or the laird. And you can see on the map to the right to the left, which uh, John Gilbert put together, these are forests that were created during the 12th and 13th centuries. It doesn't have all the forests by any means. And you can see it covers large areas of southern Scotland, eastern Scotland, right up into the Cairngorms. You can see it at Rothy Mercus. Athol Forest was a large forest in Vanessa area, but it's a royal forest. So these were large areas of land. The idea of it, by managing the these as forests for the benefit of maintaining the deer was an important notion because what it meant was you had to have a habitat that was suitable, which was a mixture of woodland and open ground. And the term that was used in used in forest law is venison and burt. So this is an important thing because it led to a whole lot of limitations on things that you could do. You couldn't uh, graze your animals without license in a forest. You couldn't create build shielings. You couldn't take in new bits of land for cultivation. So it was a bit like establishing a national park with a whole new level of restriction. But it wasn't just nothing happened, and that uh, because pressures on on the on both the king and uh, on barons was such that uh, people wanted to take in new land. People wanted to do all the things that uh, they weren't supposed to. So inevitably you get the licensing of these things. You get also people who are granted areas of land to take in. New tent, you get um, new settlements being created, but they had this particular characteristic. There's um, a very good example in Annandale of a piece of land at Kinmont that was that the uh, William of Carlisle, the landowner, was given the right to take in a new land at a place called Newby, good name, with which he had to enclose in a ditch and a hedge. And a hedge in, the, the, in that um, could be a fence. But the idea of that was that it was a, a fence which would keep out the deer and, keep, and demarcate not only the intake of land, the cultivation, but also prevent deer getting easily into that new piece of cultivated land. It also meant that it was built with a ditch on the outside, and there's an example here on the screen, the deer dike, as I shall call them, which has got a ditch, a thrown up bank. On the top of the bank, you would have um, either a fence or a, a hedge, but a fence is a more effective means of establishing a barrier, and it has to be high enough to prevent the easy access of deer into the enclosed area. This kind of landscape can be found in Bedborough Forest, in Annandale Forest, in Liddesdale Forest, it's in Renfrewshire, in Renfrew Forest there. So, was, and I've found examples even as far north as the Cairngorms. So, it is something that does crop up quite widely. They, they're typical of the period of the 12th and 13th centuries. They tend to they disappear from the records after that. The idea of the term is assart is not used after the beginning of the 14th century. And it may be for other economic reasons as well. So now, oh, sorry, what's first then we need to also think about what animals were being hunted in Scotland and what, uh, what species they were. Native species are uh, red deer and roe deer. Uh, we know that um, red deer were certainly hunted uh, frequently, but roe ro deer as well. And these turn up in collections of uh, bones that are found in excavations uh, quite regularly. Edinburgh Castle, Stirling Castle, other castles certainly are producing these species. Whether those bones are the result of hunting directly is obviously difficult to say, but what doesn't happen is uh, fallow deer do not seem to appear in these collections. And oddly, we know they were imported to Scotland uh, in the late 13th century, they were at Stirling Park. And later on in the 15th and 16th centuries, they were in Royal Park, like Stirling and Falkland Park. They were, and they were hunted obviously in those parks. We know James VI certainly hunted them and he had to bring them in from England quite often because 
maintaining the fallow deer stock seems to have been a bit of a problem. Perhaps he was too active a hunter in his parts. But there is a bit of a dichotomy in evidence between uh, the what's found in the archaeological assemblages and uh, what we know about uh, the, the running of um, parks in Scotland. And parks are something that we will come to later on. How were they hunted? Well, they're always hunted with dogs. Dogs are an essential requirement in this process. Uh, you can see dogs um, bring, trying to bring down a red deer on the Pictish stone on the right, and also part of a, a team of people on the tomb in Rodal Harris of Alexander MacLeod. They're quite useful images, those, because they relate to the kinds of hunting that were common. Uh, the drive was one of the most common in, uh, uh, in many parts of Scotland. It was used uh, for a major hunt, create a single team of people who will walk across the countryside, driving deer into uh, a natural gully, or elric is the Gallic word, where the waiting nobles would be to bring down the, the deer and uh, uh, create this sort of denouement to the hunt. So the drives one of the key ones, and the image on the left is a, like a tinkle. You've got a row of people who are spread out across the country. I'll come back to that to give you a bit, bit more detail on the practice. The chase is the other form where you actually, this is um, where you identify an individual stag you want to hunt because it's got perhaps lots of points on the on the on its antlers you would try and you, a forester or a huntsman would uh, try and pin down a particular stag and obtain its droppings and it would present those to the to the, the lord or the, the king who was about to lead the hunt and say right well this, these are the droppings of the the, the beasts that we're after and the then the dogs would get the scent from the droppings and you would uh, set off after the scent chase down that particular stag. So a chase is another uh, form which is common. There's also a third form which is coursing, which is done, if you, as it says, in a course. So you'd have to actually build a, a structure. These, we know that these are, this is a method that's used quite widely in Europe. So those are the main forms of hunt and will they pertain to some of what we're going to talk about later. Just to give a bit of colour, I thought I'd go over this. John Taylor, the penniless pilgrim, travelled up to Scotland in the reign of James I because he wanted to find out about Scotland, and he wrote a book on the back of his trip, The Penniless Pilgrimage. But in, he, he managed to get invited on a, a hunt by the Earl of Mar, and this is his description and it, read it out it gives you a bit of uh, colour if you like and it brings into it brings a lot a whole lot of information to bear which is relevant the manner of the hunting is this five or six hundred men do rise early in the morning and do disperse themselves divers ways and eight seven eight or ten miles compass they do bring or chase in the deer in many herds two three or four hundred in a herd to such and such a place as the nobleman shall appoint them then when the days come, the lords and gentlemen of their companies do ride or go to the said places, wading, sometimes wading up to their middles through burns and rivers, and then being come to the place, do lie down on the ground, till those foresaid scouts, which are called the tinkle, do bring down the deer beside their bows and arrows, which they carry with them, a harquebus or a musket. After we stayed there three hours, we might perceive the deer appear around us which being followed close by the tinkle and chased down into the valley where we lay. Then all the valley on each side being waylaid with a couple of hundred strong, strong Irish greyhounds, they let loose as the occasion serves upon the herd of deer so that with dogs, guns, arrows, dirks and daggers, in the space of two hours, four score fat deer were slain. A whole lot of useful social information in there as well as uh, the kinds of weapons they were using, but also the landscape context of, uh, of the drive and the area that was covered by the, the, the tinkle to bring in the deer. So that a whole lot of very useful information. I, I was impressed that they were actually willing to 
take out an arquebus to shoot anything like a, like a deer in the countryside, but perhaps they did. So that's the kind of hunting that we know was taking place. But where was it being conducted? Well, it's been conducted wherever, of course, there are deer on, and, in, and often in forests that we know about. And there's one or two mentioned up here, the Ettrick Forest and Athol Forest. But the main point I want to make here is that lots of places or castles were known to, or were thought to have been built as hunting lodges because they're in suitable locations. There's Newark Castle near Selkirk in Ettrick Forest was brown, if you like, seats where they could go to hunt within Ettrick Forest. But if you go to the other end of uh, the River Yarrow, uh, you're a considerable distance from uh, Newark Castle. And there's a there's a site there in Miggot Water, which is now under the reservoir, called Crown Towers, which was uh, used by both King James V and Mary to, as a site to have a, a hunt. And they would spend a whole number of days in, a, in the place hunting deer in the area. But not only were they hunting, they were also conducting business. A lot, they, a lot of ambassadors would come onto the hunt with them. They would have obviously a company of uh, the, the barons or you know, big wigs of, of the day. To, as in support, and this was a, a major then political and social event, and you had large numbers of uh, people supporting it. They even built a road over from Bramelia to the Megat Water over the hills, to, so that uh, all the things that they needed on the hunt would be there. So this is a mega, um, a big exercise. If there wasn't the, the buildings or the places to stay, they would actually build them, and in the in uh, the Athol Forest, at a place called Lunkerty, which itself means temporary structures, on the Anne Lockenburn, uh, there's a site that is was only known until recently on um, part map and uh, the name on later maps. But with the help of John Gilbert, who was doing the documentary work, we, he, he said he'd found this site on the Anne Locken that seemed to fit the bill as the location of a, of a hunting lodge that's been created especially for the hunts conducted by James and Queen Mary later on. We went up there in July last year and uh, made the, the first record that's been made of this site. So there are sites like these that um, a little aren't very well known but can be teased out from with the help of documentation. But they, the first site you might think it would just look like another shielding site, but by the time we had made a plan of it, we realized that the, uh, there are three reasonably substantial buildings around a courtyard. These smaller oblong structures, we think are shielding huts that are built into the, uh, on the site later on. There's also another outlier, a large building there. And you notice that, um, the Loch Truke site that James II had was combined a hall, a chamber, and a kitchen. Well, if you've got a courtyard, you'd have you've got the a range of three buildings around that courtyard. So I think we're looking at the site of uh, James the Fifth and Mary's um, Lunkerty or hunting lodge. There are other kinds of buildings that are also found at um, hunting site, and they may be called, in documents, they're sometimes called hunt halls. Or, uh, so there are, there's a range of terminology. Whether they mean different structural remains, we're still trying to understand and get to grips with. So these are the kinds of, these are one thing you may find at, in hunting locations. The other thing that uh, they did to try and enhance the experience of hunting was create parks and a park was an exclusive space so you could keep a deer in there in the, and there's a reasonable chance they wouldn't escape and that was because you would build a dike around it. The uh, diked area then would be uh, would be retain the deer stock until you hunted them out so you'd have to keep restocking it so it's what do you get for example at Stirling which is created by William the Lion is 
later on a new park was created a few a uh, few kilometers away for the, uh, because they needed to provide stock for the the old park so there's an evolution but they also so which we need to understand better within the park you would it's a it's a pleasure area so you're not just keeping deer you'd have perhaps white cattle we know they're documented in the parks in scotland well parks I like the chilling and wild cattle, for example. You, so you, you might also have horse studs. You have gardens. We know about the King's Knot, uh, Sterling. So they have a range of things that might be found within them. They also have woodland because you're keeping deer stock. They like some cover as well as some open ground. And ideally, you have um, a varied terrain, so you've got the right sort of terrain for hunting in the park. So that's the sort of concept. I put the image up on the right because it's a bit of fun because it was um, uh, illustrates the book of, by the Master of Game by Edward Duke of York, who was uh, imprisoned for a while under Henry IV and created this ideal notion of what hunting and hunting parks would be about, and the practices that went with them. This this image is great because you've got both you've got all the all the animals we want. We've got a red deer, we've got a fallow deer, we've got a roe deer. We've also got pigs or possibly a boar, and we've got a rabbit. I did one. There's a fox there. I did wonder if one any of these were cat-like beasts, but um, possibly this one. I'm not sure. So I thought I'd get a cat in somehow. So let's have a look at some of these medieval parks. Sterling Park is the is one that probably people most people know about. But there's Holyrood Park too, up just outside. Um, this is one end of the of Edinburgh, of course. Stirling Park, though, has a lot of the characteristic features that you might be able to find and recognise. It's got the King's Knot, of course, that we, we know about, and which is used right up until the reign of Charles I. We don't know how early it started as a site or as a garden. We've got um, evidence of the pale because we've got still got an eight foot high wall running along the south side of the park which is as marked here along that line there this that's in that area there in other parts it's not as well preserved and in one part it's crossed over by the m9 so it's been uh, uh, been rather reduced and there's also a later um laid built along the line of it which has impinged on it so you, there is still some evidence for the stone dikes. Holyrood has a large, sorry, high stone dike around the east end that still survives. It may be from the 16th or 17th centuries when the park was enclosed. We also have areas of open water, both for pleasure, but also the drinking water for the animals that are in the park. And at um, Sterling, we were able to use LIDAR to actually define the extent of a lock that was created especially by building a dam across a natural gully within the park. So that's like um, an idealized park that we have still in Scotland and it's now in public in history owned by the, managed by the Crown Estate, but it's now managed by the council. So it's largely occupied by a golf course. So who were building parks? Well, the, the King's obviously been mentioned and he built a whole number of different parks from the reign of William the Lion onwards. Uh, we get these parks being created and managed. Falkland Park is, is another one later on that was used by the Stuarts. We've got barons building them. We've got um, abbots and of monasteries, uh, bishops building them. Paisley Abbey had a walled park, for example. And even knights such as uh, John of Carlisle at Kinwent, who was mentioned earlier, well, rather his, one of his relations is mentioned earlier. The size of these parks is quite um, wide ranging. They range from 30 odd acres in at Sankar, but also up to hundreds of acres in the respect of Kincardine, which we're going to have a look at later. The map I just want to draw your attention to with the spots on it, because these are sites that are in the record, the Canmore record at present. What I've done is done a little bit of a filter. You've got the red dots, which are just recorded as deer park from on the basis of whatever archaeology has been found. Some of them are called park pale, which is I'm just found something that looks like park pale, but the kind of thing we've been looking at in an earthen bank and ditch, perhaps. 
Well, they might, or we've got a park wall, so they may have just found a bit of the walling of a park, like we've just seen. But also got traps, and you'll notice there's two being marked on the west coast. There's another one that's documented in Dura, which uh, uh, is not on the, in the record yet because its location hasn't been pinned down, but it's certainly, I've seen aerial photographs of it. There's another one down the borders, which is Dormant Hope that we're going to be looking at towards the end of this talk. But why are they such different sizes and does that mean they're doing different things in them? And I think that that is one of the research questions for the future. There are clearly varieties here. And we're going to look at two or three just to get a feel for that. Does it bite is one that it's not documented as such. Uh, it's within on the edge of the Royal uh, Forest of Cluny, but it's situated several kilometres from the castle on Loch Cluny. Uh, Will in the line apparently reserve land in the in this area, but we don't know. But there's no actual direct reference to a park. Park, I think we do have in that we've got this bank and ditch with a bank with a ditch on the inside the opposite of what you have with an intake of land for cultivation. The dike runs across the three ridges here, turns and then runs along a gully and then runs back over the three ridges, comes back along the edge of the river terrace. So to outline it, you can see it there. But overlooking it, on a slightly higher ridge, is this very substantial building. I've labelled a Hunt Hall, which we'll just, we're going to come, we'll look at in a little more detail. This is a very large building. It, it was so upstanding, it was still, it was big enough to be recognised by the Ordnance Surveyors in the 19th century. Uh, and because of that, it was probably not considered as an antiquity, but perhaps as a, an old farm building. But actually it's, it's not what it seemed. Excavations conducted by Kevin Malloy and Derek Hall in the, well, they started this work about 10 years ago as a project on medieval parks. Kevin Malloy was doing a PhD on, on the topic and uh, they decided to investigate both the, uh, the boundaries of these parks and some of the structures related to the parks. And this uh, determined them that they would have a look at this very large building and they were able to produce dating for it, which pinned it down to the 13th and 14th centuries. They actually got a radiocarbon date from some charcoal on the floor here. And we're very lucky to find a, a smashed uh, jug or storage jar um, in, the, uh, in the drain on one side of the building. It seems to be largely an earthen structure that they survive in the walls, presumably faced with stones. It's not as they only had a narrow uh, excavation. Uh, we have relatively little information about it, but in plan it had an entrance in one end and inside, so maybe there were subdivisions that don't survive, but it's such a large building, it could it compares well with halls in some of the castles that we find in Scotland, and, uh, or it's comparable, the one that comes to mind is Skindrocket in, in the heart of the Cairngorms at Braemar, which is a hall house of comparable dimensions but it doesn't mean the whole thing was open. And if you look at, that's to give you an idea of the scale, you can see that in the distance there, I'm standing at one end. So it is a substantial structure. You can clearly have gatherings of that sizable number of people. But the dating is good for um, something that coincides with the Royal Forest. It's all, but how, why is it situated outside the park? But I think the key thing is it overlooks the park. So it's a good position to be in for um, entertaining or staying while you're actually conducting hunting in the area. So in which case, what was the role of the park with the forest uh, that was adjacent to it? Derek Hall and Kevin uh, Malloy excavated a whole series of trenches across the boundaries and were lucky enough to find the remains of the posts of the paling that presumably stood on the top. They did there is, whether it's a paling or a wicker fence, it was meant to be a barrier on the top of the dike that would then ensure that deer could not escape. And I put up a two metre hole in the post hole that they found uh, that's shown on that section. And you can see that it has an angle to it. And they argued that from the 
postals uh, alignment that they weren't perfectly vertical posts and were set on purpose so that anything out of the the arc was uh, very difficult for a deer because you've already got a, a thing that's a couple of meters high if you add that on top it's certainly well over anything that most deer are going to escape from Fortunately, they didn't get any dating for the park pale, and this is this is one of the themes of this: is that finding evidence of from these sites is not easy to date them. It's the nature of the beast; they're not near habitations or places that tend to gather things within the context of the park pale. One of the other parks that we know a good deal about that's well recorded in the, from the reign of William the first through to John the castle built in the 13th century just outside it. The extent of the park is considerable. It's, it's about three kilometers east west and at least two north south. We don't have the exact area on the south side that it extended to. We have, we've got Hunter's Hall here and there's a part of a Deer dike in the woods there, so we think it came, came down as far as that. But in addition to the basic enclosure of the park, it also had a, a trap added on to the north side, uh, which encloses the upper part of a natural gully, which you can see here on the photograph. The nick in the tree in the hills here is the ridge up here where the closes it runs along the uh, crest here and comes up to that um, nick in the in the ridge so it could be used as a trap it's got um, a bank a ditch on the inside and in this part of it it's actually built with a revetted stone wall the variation on the theme that uh, we've had of banks and ditches or stone walls so there's another variation in what you might find this is intriguing. So you could obviously drive from the hills uh, deer into this gully. You could use you could restock the park by that method. So you've got a variation on a theme. Um, at Sterling, I suggested that the new park perhaps provided a way of maintaining stock for the the old park. But of course, we've also got uh, hunting forest beyond the old park on the Vintry uh, Hills. So there may be um, quite a lot of interesting management of deer alongside the actual enclosure of a park where you've got a stock of deer. Did they supply deer regularly then to the cartels that they're near or, um, or were they just for, purely for pleasure? There are a whole lot of questions in there. The theme of traps, I think, is, what is, is where we're going with this because uh, something that is less easy to pin down. You what you find with traps is uh, there are lengths of, of wall or of a bank and ditch that don't necessarily at first sight seem to make much sense. But I was intrigued when we when I went to Rum in the 1990s by these monuments and we actually uh, recorded them in the Royal Commission during the uh, return visit at the end of the 1990s in de a bit more detail. This stone dike here, which you can see, there's a considerable amount of stone which runs along the crest of a ridge here on one side of the Glen Duin uh, and runs up to the crest. I think you can just about make out the crest here. And there's a gap at the top. Um, my thought was this is basically where you're driving the deer up the glen and the dikes mean you don't have to man them to any great degree. You can concentrate on driving the deer to the head where you have a, a the lords and ladies are waiting to kill the deer as they come up. Actually, there's an extra feature that goes with it because on the steep slope on the downside from the, that ridge is a V-shaped, uh, two V-shaped, uh, sort of V-shape of walls, stone dikes running down the hill. And at the bottom of the best preserved of the two that there are in this glen is this one here with an enclosure at the bottom, providing a sort of close killing ground. This is an, another variation on the theme. 
We have no idea, though, in this case, what date the trap is, is dates to. It could be any date in the sort of, I'll call it medieval period in the broad sense. We know that deer, though, were, uh, was, there weren't any deer left on rum by, by the middle of the 18th century and had to be brought in again in the 19th century, so, and later on too. So this, there is a problem then about, you know, how, how was the stock managed on the island and uh, where were the people coming to drive the deer in an area like this? They brought from other islands? Because there's not many settlements on the island. Anyway, lots of lots more questions that are raised by that. Moving to the other end of the country, though, we have at Hermitage in Liddesdale, not far from Castle, uh, Newcastleton, Hermitage Castle. Hermitage Castle was um, built at the end of the 13th century, but the state of Liddesdale was given to the de Sulis family, one of the followers of King David, and they appear to have built interesting structures outside the present castle, which includes another V-shaped area, it's actually seen on Rum, but in this case running down the hill towards the castle it would seem. However, it doesn't go as far as the castle. This is one, the other, it comes to a, uh, a neck here and there's a slight gap which may be a Maybe in my mind, I wondered about whether there's an, a parallel with or analogy with what you've got on rum. Perhaps they built a wooden enclosure there to have a killing ground for the deer. I did um, use this as uh, the location of a recreation by David Simon of, of, a, of a hunt of a trap in uh, the book I produced in 2002 on um, poor labourers and busy husbandmen. The other point to make though about this feature is that so this side of it actually sits at the far end of it. It rests on the moated site here. Which now it contains a 13th century chapel, but I think is the site of a hunting lodge. A moated site is a typical uh, kind of manorial site of the 12th to the 14th centuries in uh, England and indeed in Scotland. And if we look on the on this uh, plan here that was produced during a survey we conducted in the 1990s. You can see this is the trap here. Um, there's a gully called the Ladies' Psyche. So the deer would be driven off the hill. And this, was, this area was referred to in the 14th century as the forest, whereas large parts of Liddesdale had been taken in as arts and cultivated. This, uh, the, the trap here though, rests on the moated site uh, and gives us at least some sort of date range because we know that by the time we get to the uh, late century that we've got a park created at the site which closes the castle within it. So there's there's the white dike which is described there. The white dike is actually a stone dike. So that's quite an early example of a stone dike. Uh, part of it, though, was built as a bank and ditch, which is this bit here with the ditch on the inside. But it cuts across and, and closes off the access to the trap, and gives us a and runs over it down here. So we have a sequence. So we have a rough, if you like, date range of some mid twelfth through to mid to late fourteenth, the, both the construction of the trap and also then the creation of the park later on certainly by 1376. So here we've got an example of an Anglo-Norman lord building both a trap and a, a deer park. And obviously there's an evolution here in his uh, management of hunting from uh, using a drive to bring deer in to perhaps in the 14th century maintaining a stock of deer. So in the last sort of five or ten minutes, we're just going to have a little bit, bit of a look at this place called Dormant Hope, because this takes us in a slightly different direction again in terms of our understanding of these things. Dormant Hope is a valley that runs up to the borderline with England. This is uh, the borderline here. It's in the in Hoonan Parish in the Cheviots. And the top of the valley is surrounded by an earthwork which runs from Elinic, which is the farm, farmhouse here, a sheep farm built in going back to the 18th century, 
uh, and the other side of it ends uh, to just on the left here. I don't know if you can make out the boundary that's visible in the snow there. But that's the extent of it. It's, it's over a kilometre wide by a kilometre deep. And the dike, a bit like in, in Rum, runs along the crest, but it doesn't have, have any gap at the end. It entirely encloses the upper part of the valley, but is open to a drive of beer, if you like, into the lower part of the valley. The site, the, the wall is, um, the, the dike is a mixture of bone revetted bank and a bank and ditch on the inside, if you like, of the monuments. It's first recorded by, um, in terms of uh, mapping, that is, by General Roy's team of mappers and surveyors, and they show at least two sides of it. They plate it with is some other features that we'll have a look at. So if General Roy's team of surveyors didn't actually understand it, nor did um, the Royal Commission in 1945, who clearly couldn't conceive of the idea of um, a hunting trap or a park or anything of that sort, and they conflated the monument with some cross-ridge dikes, which are prehistoric monuments, uh, which run across a ridge to prevent access up and down the ridge. That's, uh, and we know that they date to that from how the, they relate to some Roman roads. We'll see a map of um, Deer Street with overlying some of these later on. Why didn't they recognise it, um, especially as it does monument does actually run down here, but they were misled by the trackways that run along the side of it and braid over time. They must have braided after them. The traps used to be used. Didn't recognize what was before them. I think they mentally weren't um, prepared to accept what they were seeing. We went back in 2000 and actually mapped it properly. It, but there's a gap here between the crossroads bike and the rest of it presently and it also has a clear relationship later than these um, ostrich dike. So we've got some useful archaeological sequence. Just before we look at the some detail, this is the, the monument and you've got the tracks that run up from the um, from Buchtrig off to the uh, northwest. Two different tracks up there, two burns here. You've got Rayshaw Fell, which is an important name to note, also Cuthbert Hope here, or Cuthbert Hope Rig. We think that the Dormant Hope used to be called Cuthbert Hope. There is some map evidence to support that. But also lots of deer names and hunting names. There's also a hunt slack just off the, the map to the north. So uh, within it, we've got um, not much archaeology. We've got some sheepfolds, a couple of huts that might have been cheeling huts at one stage um, and, and a building up at the top here which we'll have a look at later so we're going to do a quick round robin and then um, discuss it, the, the meaning and understanding of this monument further this is where the dike which you can see is substantial still stands up to about two meters in height from the bottom of the ditch in places excuse me that's through one of the this is the crossridge dike one of them on the the way on the east west side here. From the air, you can see how the path that we're looking at cuts across the crossbridge bank. You can also see the trackways coming up, the burn here, and braiding so that one one part of it goes over the, the stake here and goes over the, the ridge there, but the other one, other branch comes to run along the side of the earthwork that we're looking at. There's also another trackway coming up here which runs across these two crossroads tracks and also comes up right here. So you can see that there are clearly there are routeways coming in from the northwest. In the background you can actually interestingly see a place called Moat Now which we one which is uh, thought to be a dark age uh, nuclear settlement. We did wonder whether there's any relationship with it. Can't demonstrated there's no direct relationship uh, so following further south where the, you can see the track running along the side of the monument here there's no ditch here because it's so steep on the inside and it's the 
it gives the impression, in other words, that there's a ditch where this track runs along. It's further along to the south. You can see I'm still following the monument here. This is a section where the commission in 45 didn't recognize it as an earthwork, which I'm sorry to say I fail to understand now, but you, there are several different courses to the various tracks. There's one that comes over the hill here to run down alongside. And we know that we've already seen one that's running right along the side of it. There's some evidence that at one stage it's been cut through by one of the by a track there. So it's been impinged upon. This is where it turns to run along the borderline. You can see it running down here and it turns east. So because of uh, wet, wetness here, it's uh, overgrown with uh, rushes, so it's difficult to see for certain that it runs across without any gap, but um, that, that we're not going to be able to find out without archaeology. What um, I can show you here for a nice aerial photograph is how the thing comes down and turns to go along the borderline. You can see the ditch is showing in places just there and from the darker shadow on this side. Crossridge Dyke here runs up and stops just short and has a, a bank on the north side, which is the opposite side from one that uh, is a bit of the sort of the ditch and bank arrangement of the deer dyke here. So I don't quite understand, as I say, why the Royal Commission refused to accept what they were seeing, because there's more than one reason why they should have interpreted it differently. But, you know, we all make mistakes. Uh, this is to take you to the other corner here. Uh, you can see it running along the borderline, quite visible over a considerable distance. It comes down to this, this gully, rather like at the other end, and runs up the other side. At this point, it changes into a revetted stone wall with an earthen bank on the outside. This is interesting because it's very like what we saw at Kincardin. Uh, having a device like this means that it could make it easier for deer to get in, of course. It might be that on this side they were actually happy to encourage deer to get in, because we don't know quite how the earthwork part, the earthen bank part of it was uh, fenced, whether what sort of height or how substantial that was. So there are lots of management questions we can't directly answer at the moment. But just next to the kip here, which is a nice interesting conical mound, it's the site of a building. And that building overlooks the head of the valley. The head of the valley has some relatively relatively open space. Uh, and having a building at this location means you can observe activity within the upper part of the glen. You can therefore observe whether the deer are actually grazing or gathering in the upper part. Uh, and therefore you can monitor their presence and decide when it's a good time to go hunting. Or equally, because it's a trap, it's open at one end, you can drive deer into it, but you can also monitor then their, where exactly they are from this situation. So it could have served as a huntsman's bottom, but equally it's um, a building that's large enough to provide overnight shelter for a huntsman. And it, it is one of the, one of the, it's a characteristic thing, but we've seen it at Buzzard Nights, but of deer parks in England for there to be a hunting lodge for a huntsman in a place that overlooks the park. And if you remember at Stirling, there was a keeper's house, which is actually in the highest part of the, the park overlooking the rest of it. So this is an important situation, therefore, for a building to be in. And there are no other buildings of any substance in the area. The two huts in the in the valley, down this one on here, are uh, sort of six feet long internally by uh, a bit less uh, wide. So they're quite small and narrow huts for when I stay. They might be shielding huts, or they might be shepherds. Bothy in the, in the post medieval period. The building itself is was difficult to photograph, but the yeah, air, it's uh, visible here on this uh, get mapping shot, which shows uh, the wall of it there overgrown, and it actually is, runs into the longer vegetation. So it's not 
uh, or easy to photograph. But that's, that's the situation of the building. You can see the uh, enclosing dike here. It comes to an end on the east side, in the middle of this flat tab, um, plateau called Broadlaw, good name for it. But it actually turned here to go down into this gully. There's really no intention or no evidence that it goes across to join the other end. You might just about make out the dike on the other side of the valley coming down here towards P. Linick, uh, farmhouse. So that's the monument. In the last few minutes I'm going to uh, tease out what we can say about it in terms of its dating, in terms of its uh, uh, period of use and also its context, which is, an, which is where the he comes in. We have some useful documentation in this part of the world. Melrose Abbey was involved in a series of grants brought by the Lords of Hoonham, who were an Anglian family. Uh, they, uh, we have records of them going back to the early part of uh, the uh, 12th century from these grants. They got, uh, they, they gave Hoonham Grange to the Abbey, but they also gave this estate of Rayshaw. Rayshaw means wood of the wood of the road here. And they presumably got this as a bit of summer grazing to go with their uh, farm further down the valley. The description of the boundaries are quite useful because they describe it as going following Deer Street. It also bounds against the Umpreville lands in which in Reedsdale over the border. It bounds with the Chateau Estate on the north on the northwest, and this is the Chateau Estate, the names are still preserved in present farms. And it also is described as running up a path or from the Cape Hope Burn. And then it runs up to run along the ditch between the shore and Cuthbert Hope. The name of the still, still extant in the ridge, uh, one side of um, the dormant hope. So we have, that's a key bit of evidence. We'll look at the, in detail at that um, description in a moment. We also, interestingly, the, the whole of Hoonham was granted as free forest to William and Hoonham, which meant that he therefore was able to manage hunting of deer over the land that he had actually given to Melrose Abbey, which is um, a, bit of a, um, <laughs> a retaliation, I would have said. Uh, there's no doubt the, um, the monks perhaps hoped they had rights to the deer when they got those estates. The description that we have from the charter actually, the, as I say, the key detail for recognising that we can pin down the dating of that uh, earthwork to before the last quarter of the 12th century. It describes it from the Cape of Burn up, up all that path to the ditch between Rayshaw and Cuthbert Hope. And remember what I said about Dormant Hope having been a change of name. And by the whole boundary between me and Richard Unpenpool to Deer Street in the west, and by Deer Street all the way to the boundary of Chateau, so by that boundary between me and Chateau to the Cape of Hope Burn. So that's the bounds. We've got then a reasonable argument for suggesting then that the earthwork was already there by 1175 when William of uh, Hoonham granted it. We also have other dating. It postdates the cross ridge dikes, which are generally dated the pre Roman Iron Age and, and certainly to later prehistory. There were and also we know that it's overlain by the trackways that I showed you some evidence for on the ground and appears on Roy's map. So we've got a fairly good um, bit of evidence to build up. Some of it's more circumstantial than the others. Roy's map is only giving us a terminus antiquum of 1747, isn't it? There's a plan here which I put up because it shows crossroads bikes running under Deer Street on the run up to the borderline. So, just to reiterate, that's Cuthbert Rig, and we think this is Cuthbert, oh, sorry, Cuthbert Hope. This is the way that comes up from the Cape Hope Burn, and it runs along then from B to C 
along the side of, along the ditch, well, as it calls it. Now a ditch in these terms means a bank and a ditch. So it doesn't just mean a ditch. Two go together in uh, description of the boundaries. So I'm making that case that we can date then this monument to before 1175 and to um, a context which puts it into the Anglian realm because the family were of Anglian origin. There's no sign in their names that uh, they particularly um, were um, Anglo-Norman in any sense whatsoever. Their great-grandfather, William's great-grandfather, was called Elaf, and there are other suitably uh, Anglian names too from other members of the family. William obviously could be an Anglo-Norman name by that stage. But I think that the background is potentially Anglian origin. We're in an Anglian area of Scotland. But in following that tack, we began to think about uh, the area and about um, what that might mean. Because in Anglian areas of the country, they use they have a thing called a hay, a term called a hay to describe the fences that are built to assist hunts in the late Anglo-Saxon period. And some of those went on to be places where parks were later built in, uh, in the aftermath of the Anglo-Norman, uh, sorry, the Norman invasion. The name Hay occurs both in, Mer in sort of Mercian areas of England, but also in Cumbria and in Northumberland. But lo and behold, we then discovered that we could find them in the borders. Hoyk, after all, is a hay name. And but we also have one at Jedburgh that appears in a charter of David the First. Quick Hay is a place where they where it's recorded they built four and a half miles worth of of um, a fence, a, 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 a hay around a piece of ground, a piece of woodland actually. Is so we think we've got something here that could be in that context as a place that's. Uh, built with uh, fences to aid the process of hunting. And this is that makes would make it a unique monument because uh, the only examples of anything remotely like this in England are stray bits of bank and ditch that don't make, a, if you like, a complete monument. They're just stray pieces. But the descriptions we have do suggest that their functions. It's a bit like what we saw in Rum, if you, uh, where you have pieces of stone dike there built to drive the deer into certain locations. So that's what I think we've got. We've also interestingly got things then that you would find at um, parks elsewhere, such as the building overlooking the top. Um, so you've got a something that's probably evolving, of course, and once they become effectively Anglo-Norman in their culture, when they've become they have rights to forest in Hoonham, they are going to be starting to adopt many of the uh, aspects of Anglo-Norman culture that was growing at that time. So that's where I'm taking you with this. And just to sum up the whole thing, I've probably gone on way, way too long. We've got hunting is something you might think, oh, doesn't leave much in the way of trace in the landscape. What I hope I've shown is that you can find both lodges and places that uh, people have stayed in while they're conducting a hunt. Uh, you've got uh, enclosures built to create exclusive places for hunting for the king and barons and ecclesiastics. But you've also got traps. And these things are occurring in both Anglo-Norman and apparently in Norse Gallic areas of Scotland. But also now we can see in the Anglian southeast with a family whose origins are clearly Anglian. So I think that um, we've ended up in a place that I didn't expect to be in when I was uh, researching these things a year or two back. And I, I think that sort of develops the whole business of understanding these things into a uh, much wider context. In other words, we shouldn't assume things were just in, done in one way either, because clearly they're building both traps, they're building parks, they're managing deer in a variety of different ways of bringing in deer from England when they want them. This is clearly a key part of, if you like, the 
social enhancement of the aristocracy and it's very much in that to be seen in that context right i'm going to bring this to a close and say thank you for listening and i will uh, stop the share in a minute but i just thought i'd leave up for a moment the last slide because there's a series of um, reading that you might want to take a little note of if you want me to stop sharing i'll do so when, whenever you want um roland okay um i can make sure that um people will get a list will could get access to that list even if you don't um even if we don't share your presentation. I think for the sake of Q&A, um, Piers, now might be the time to um, stop sharing.